So we provide you with that story. And I hope, hopefully, that will be very helpful. How many of you in here have ever been on a cruise? You have cruised before. Raise your hand. Uh, vast majority of you. Some of you. How many of you have not been on a cruise? How many of you would you like to? How many of you don't ever want to step foot on one? Okay. <laughs> Just check it. Well, if you go on a cruise, uh, there is usually what's called a port of call. Now that is where they pull the ship in, they stop it, you get off the ship, and you get to go into the town of whatever country you're in, and you get to hang out for a little while. You don't get to see the entire town, or if you're in Hawaii, the entire island, but you get to see a small section of it, and you can always say, I've been there, I've set foot there. And that's kind of what we're going to be doing today in this particular chapter of the story, chapter 15. We're going to have a quick cruise around and get an overview of the prophets at that time. But then we're going to dock. My phone's ringing. We're going to dock the ship and we're going to look at certain parts in detail as we continue the story in chapter 15. And it's called God's Messengers. Hold on, this is Con Boss. That's our women's ministry coordinator here. Fawn, uh, do you realize I'm preaching? <laughs> oh, you knew that, but you did not want me to forget to share the women's stuff. Fawn, well, I, I, I did that. You're starting to sound like my wife now. Uh, okay. Uh, no, what do you really call for? Oh, you wanted me to tell the church that all the women are having a great time. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. 
So we attempt to see in the story both lower and upper story perspective. And last week, as the nation was divided after the reign of Solomon, Jeroboam and Rehoboam got into a fuss and they split the nation. Now, they were not brothers. They just had similar names. One was the son of Solomon. One had been on Solomon's cabinet. And they had two different views of how the country should be governed. And so it was split in two. It seemed like that Jeroboam and Rehoboam, lower story perspective, it seemed like they were to blame. They had this fuss and they couldn't get along. But as we took a step back and saw it from the upper story, we saw that God was achieving his purpose. The question that looms before us at this moment then is why did God divide the nation to accomplish his purpose? Couldn't he have done it if they were united? <clears throat> the answer to that question is yes, he could have. But they could not stay united on their own and they weren't trusting God. So God, from his upper story, took the lower story problems of humanity and he worked through them to accomplish his overall perspective. Let me give you three quick ideas of why God did this. One, God divided the nation because his people were sending the wrong message. You see, God wanted his people, Israel, to be blessed by him so that others would be drawn to the God of Israel. God wanted to so work in the nation of Israel, and he wanted the nation of Israel to be so dependent upon him, that by their dependence upon him, they would receive blessings from him, that other nations would look at Israel and say, I want to worship their God. He's better than ours. And that wasn't happening. Let me state the obvious. What God wanted to do with Israel in the Old Testament is what God desires to do with you and me called the church in the New Testament. So as we look at this Old Testament story, I'm going to ask you to look at it from an upper story perspective and realize that as we look at Israel, we might also be looking in the mirror at ourselves. So the questions that come out of the passage of the Old Testament may be exceedingly relevant for us where we are in our own personal lives today. Well, the nation that God wanted to bless rebelled against God. They became complacent, first of all, in their devotion to God. That led to disobedience to God's directives. And then they became blatant worshipers of God's enemy, the pagan gods of Baal and Asherah. And in disobedience, God's people were sending the wrong message to their own people as well as to the other nations around them. Let me put that in a contemporary setting. What if Gene Sperling and I were arrested frequently at one of those inappropriate massage parlors that get shut down? <laughs> God sent nine 
prophets to the 19 kings in Israel over a period of 208 years. I have been through Bible college. I've been through advanced classes in seminary. I've been reading the Bible since I was about 14 years old. And I learned something this week that had never, ever bit me before. <laughs> Do you know how many of those nine prophets would have been considered successful at what their mission was? Anybody want to take a guess? One. <clears throat> Who said one? Were you guessing? Yeah. <laughs> that was an extremely good guess. You can take tests for me, okay? You can give a guess that well. Absolutely correct. One prophet. Because you see, the role of the prophet was to call the people into a relationship with God. Even Elijah, all the people, he was successful personally, but in the mission of calling the people back to God, only one. And you know who the one was? He knows. No. Who was the guy swallowed by a big fish? Uh, the one prophet who didn't want to be a prophet. <laughs> the one who ran as fast and as far as he could for God. And the way God caught him was he swallowed by a fish. And only the belly of the fish. When his companion made the fish sick and a few jumped up on the beach. Then Jonah finally had it in the right direction. And you know why? Because God was saying Jonah, not to Israel, where he sent both of his prophets. You know why? Because Israel didn't listen to the other prophets God had sent. So he sent Jonah to the enemy of Israel. And he says, go preach to the Ninevites. And you know why Jonah didn't want to preach to the Ninevites? He hated them. He said, God, if I go preach to them, they're going to repent. They're going to fall in love with you. You're going to receive them. And you're not going to wipe them off the face of the earth like I've been praying. <laughs> and that's exactly what God did. The Ninevites did from Jonah's preaching what Israel never did from the other prophets' preaching. That's amazing. But we don't have time to stay there very long. So let's, uh, let's move on. Um, two of the nine prophets we're going to focus on today. Hosea, we're going to pull into his court. We're going to check out Hosea for just a minute. And Elijah. Those are the two that we're going to kind of look at. You see, prophets were used by God to get the attention of kings or nations as he delivered a message to them. It was probably something like this. Elijah, I am God's prophet. Will you listen to me? Can you hear me? I'm speaking for God. Now, a man. A man, if you will. One of those prophets, and you can follow along with me if you like, turn to in chapter 15, Page 215. Okay, 215. Let's see if I can pull this off. People, this is Hosea. Hear the word of the Lord, you Israelites. Because the Lord has a charge to bring against you who live in this land. There is no faithfulness in you. There is no love for me from you. There is no acknowledgement of God in the way you live. There is only cursing and lying and murdering and stealing and adultery. Are you listening to me? Let me turn the page. <laughs> you break all the bounds and your bloodshed follows you. Your deeds do not permit you to return to me. There is a spirit of prostitution in your hearts. You do not acknowledge the Lord your God. Are you listening? That was the role of a prophet. They didn't have bullhorns back then. The folks back then probably said, thank God. You see, throughout the Old Testament, God called his people to reflect his goodness and his character to the other nations that didn't know him. But inevitably... God's people refused to trust in God, and as a result, never reflected his character. So God sent his prophets to bring these words of warning and words of hope to the people. These messages often came with warnings that brought serious consequences. 
if people didn't repent. And blessings to those who were willing to return to God's way. Well, let's make a port of call to Hosea for just a moment. Hosea, one of my most fascinating, probably my second favorite prophet of the Old Testament. Elijah's my favorite. Hosea's probably my second. You see, not only by what Hosea preached would the people learn of God's character, not only would they learn of God's law and God's patience and God's love, but they would learn about God by the way in which Hosea lived. He really understood what a, a preaching professor one time said. He said, if you can't tell God's message any other way, use words. You see, that professor wanted preachers to know, let your life be a walking example of who God is. Use words as a last resort. And Hosea put that into practice. It is by his. I, I told a couple the other day, I, I often use Hosea as, a, as an illustration in premarital counseling of what unconditional love is like. And so I, I told him, I said, Hosea was a real life flannel bread store. And these two 26 year olds looked at me funny. And I stopped them and I said, did, did I say something you don't understand? And they said, what's a flannel graph story? <laughs> Quick question for you. I'm dating myself. How many of you don't know what a flannel graph story is? It's okay. Raise your hand. <laughs> Crap, I'm old. <laughs> okay, here it is. Before video and before DVD, how you would capture children's attention in Sunday school was by visualizing the story in the Bible. And what they would have is a large board of blue felt. A felt board. Okay? Flannel grip. All right? And then there would be characters that were made. They were colored characters. And they would be flannel sticky. I kind of like Velcro on, on the back side. And they would stick to the flannel. And so you could put up David with a slingshot and Goliath with a sword. And then you could make him fall in the valley. And you could do that on a big picture board. Now we have things like you saw during the offertory. But when I was a kid, flannel graph was hot. <laughs> they, they were your, thing. your church was not hip if you didn't have flannel graph. And Hosea was a walking flannel graph story. See, here's what made Hosea so unique out of all the prophets. God told Hosea to do something he never told another man that I can find recorded anywhere in Scripture or history. God told Hosea to marry a hooker. His role as a prophet was to marry a prostitute. And that's not half the, that's not half the story. The worst part of the story is, do you know what her name was? Her name was Gomer. <laughs> you not only had to marry a hooker, her name was Gomer. Try to imagine with me rolling over in the middle of the night to whisper something sweet, and you said, Oh, Gomer. <laughs> I don't know about you, but it loses something in the translation. Especially when the only Gomer I know is Gomer Pie. All right? It goes down the hill in a hurry, let me tell you. Why did God have Jose to do this? You see, he married her. He had a couple of kids. He did his prophet work. And he came home one day, and Gomer was gone. She had grown bored with being the wife of a prophet. And she went back to the streets to her old ways. Hosea says, God, what do you want me to do? Hosea, just as you did the first time, you had to go pay a price to her pay. I want you to go pay him again. Buy her back. Bring her home. Love her just as you have before. Yes. She does it again. He goes and buys her back again. And now the people come to Hosea and say, Hosea, you're a prophet. Why don't you leave her in the streets where she runs to? And Hosea didn't have an answer. And he said, God, what do I tell you? This is the plan. God says, Hosea, you tell Israel that what they see you doing for Gomer the prostitute 
is the same thing that I am doing for them. I, I redeem them out of captivity and I've given them a home and it's called the promised land. They go bored with me and they run off. This, this is old King James language, all right? I'm not making this up. You can find it in the book, okay? God says, okay, if you tell them that they get bored with me and then they go a whoring after other gods. And then they hang out there for a while and then they end up in trouble and in captivity and then they cry out to me who they've ignored while they've been whoring. And they say, God, can you bail us out? And I come and I buy them back. And I bring them home. And I fund their expansion. And I get life beautiful for them again. And then what do they do? They go bored with me. And they, and they go a whore after other gods. You probably never hear that word as many times in another sermon. <laughs> but that's the story of Hosea. It's a living flannel graph story. Now, let's move on to Elijah. All right? We're going to dock the ship now in 1 Kings chapter 18, or that's page 203 in the story. And we're going to join the prophet Elijah during the era in which God used him. During that time, the worship of God was being threatened by the worship of Baal. This was an issue with Israel right from the beginning of their days in the promised land. And now it was coming to a head again. And so the prophet Elijah was sent by God to call Israel, listen to me, Israel, and call them back to worshiping the one true God. Elijah's name reflects his message. And it reflected his calling. The second part of his name, Jah, J-A-H, it comes from Yahweh. And the first part of his name, Eli, E-L-Y, it comes from another name for God, Elohim. <coughs> Yahweh is Elohim. The Lord is God. The righteous name meant the Lord is God. God raised up Elijah as a prophet for the purpose of calling Israel back to a right relationship with him. To tell them and to remind them again that the Lord is the one God. He is the one that deserves their worship, not Baal. We're going to pick up the story in 1 Kings chapter 18. And I'm going to read a passage out of my Bible, not the storybook, simply because the storybook left a few verses out that I think are really important to set the stage for this particular moment. So I'm going to jump in at verse 1, chapter 18. After a long time in the third year, now the third year of what? This is the third year of a famine. And Elijah had told mean, nasty King Ahab and his wife Jezebel, okay, so get those two characters in your mind, Ahab and Jezebel, just a quick thought, a lot of people over the years, the centuries, have named their children after biblical characters. And, I mean, and some of them are some of the weird names. I mean, I've, I've, I've known, I've, I've met some parents who named their child Jehoshaphat. That was years ago in Alabama. Well, I, I heard it. Okay. I have never in my life heard anybody name their daughter Jezebel. And if you read the story, you'll understand why. Yeah, we had a wonderful sweet lady, an older lady in our church that we nicknamed Jezebel. But that was a funny story behind that, and I don't have time for that. Anyway. So after the third year, third year of famine, Elijah had predicted Ahab and Jezebel. The Lord came to Elijah and said, Go, present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the land. Now, the other part of the story, if you missed it, is Ahab had a bounty out on Elijah. So for God to tell Elijah, Go find Ahab, meant go find the guy who wants to kill you. Alright? So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. Now, the famine was severe in Samaria, and Ahab had summoned Obadiah who was in charge of his palace. Obadiah worked for King Ahab. Listen to this. Obadiah was a devout believer in the Lord. What a peculiar place to be working in. King Ahab, who hated God, worshipped Baal, couldn't stand God's prophet Elijah, and yet he lives right there in the same house where they have the Jezebel. While Jezebel was killing off the Lord's prophets, Obadiah had taken a hundred prophets, hidden them in two caves, fifty in each, supplied them with food and water. Hey, I said to Obadiah, go throughout the land, search all the springs and valleys. Maybe we can find grass to keep the horses and mules alive so we won't have to kill our animals. So they divided the land they were to cover. And Ahab went one direction, Obadiah another. As Obadiah was walking along, Elijah met him. 
Obadiah recognized it and bowed down to the ground and said, Is it really you, my Lord Elijah? Yes, he replied. Go tell your master. Elijah is here. And here is Obadiah, who has risked his own life by hiding a hundred prophets and feeding them out of the palace of life. And Elijah says, Go tell the king, Elijah is here. Notice what Obadiah does. What have I done wrong? Why are you handing your servant over to Ahab to be put to death? Don't you know he wants to find you and kill you? If I have to tell him you're here and I don't bring you in, he'll have my head. Great man, very scholar, all of a sudden. But anyway, confrontation story to the place. Elijah had no authority over Ahab, yet Elijah's the one who said, Ahab, I'm here. Come meet me. They speak, and something interesting takes place. They meet, and Ahab says, Elijah says to Ahab, I want to set up a duel. When, when they first meet, do you recall reading, it's in the story, do you recall reading, what did Ahab say first to Elijah? No, close. <laughs> He says, are you the troubler of Israel? And Elijah says, I have a trouble with Israel, but you and your father's family have. You've abandoned the commands of God. you follow the Baals. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel. Bring 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asher who eat at Jezebel's table. This is interesting because Elijah was the preacher and the prophet. Had no legitimate authority in the kingdom. Yet he's telling the king, the most powerful man in the world at that place, and he's telling the king, meet me at Mount Carmel. And Ahab does. And he brings all the people of Israel. And he brings 850 false prophets to meet with Elijah for the ultimate test of God's power. This is going to be a shootout, shootout at OK Mount Carmel. <laughs> One prophet of God against 850 false prophets. In verse 22, page 204 of the story, Elijah said to them, I'm the only one of God's prophets left. Elijah didn't know about the hundred hidden away. But Baal has 450. Get two bulls for us. Let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves. Let, let them cut it into pieces, put it on the wood, but do not set fire to it. I will prepare the other bull, put it on the wood, but I will not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God, and then I will call on the name of the Lord, the God who answers by fire. He is God. And all the people said, Elijah, what you say is good. They like to say, let me tell you what, Israel was playing the odds. You know where Israel would be if they were here today? Then would be two chances. Okay? Because they'd play the odds. You see, they saw 850 false prophets, and they saw one prophet of God. And they said, 850 to one, oh baby. This sounds like a good deal, Elijah. But another reason sounds good. Baal is depicted in pictures. If you go back and look at historical pictures of how Baal is envisioned in old portrait pictures, paintings done on walls, he is a god of nature and he has lightning bolts in both hands. Easy to start a fire with a lightning bolt. Okay, no problem. We've got this thing one hand down. So we have these two altars. One of the prophets of Baal are doing before the other, which is going to be committed to Elijah's God. So the prophets of Baal start calling on the name of Baal. They started early in the morning. They go till noon and nothing happens. Hours went by. 450 prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of Asherah. Notice how the enemies to each other join together when they're doing battle against God. See, Asherah and Baal didn't have anything to do with each other. But that day they did. Because they wanted God to lose. High noon, Elijah begins to talk to him. Page 204 of the story. Shout louder, Elijah says to those 850 false prophets. Surely your God is there. Maybe he's asleep and thought. Maybe he's busy or he's traveling. Maybe you need to wake him up. This is the first account I can find in history of trash talking. <laughs> and it's Elijah. The New Living Translation, any of you read from that, it's a great translation. I've got a couple of hands going up. The New Living Translation renders that verse, verse 27, chapter 18, this way. Elijah says, you'll have to shout louder, for surely he is a god. Perhaps he's daydreaming, or maybe he's relieving. Then the fire of the Lord fell, and it burned up the sacrifice, the woods, the clothes. 
solid stone, the soil. It licked up the water and the trench. And when all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and crying, The Lord, He is God! They didn't want the fire to fall on them. The Lord, He is God. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> Yahweh is Elohim. The Lord, He is God. The meaning of a righteous man is now carried out visually before the <laughs> But Elijah's not done. He knows that if he leaves the influence of 450 of Baal's prophets around, it won't be long before the people are running back to Baal. So what does Elijah do? He takes them down to the valley and slaughters them. He has them all like that. But he's not finished yet. It's 16 miles from Mount Carmel back to Jezreel. And Elijah, the scripture says, empowered by God, tucks his cloak into his belt. That was for less wind resistance. I suggest to you it's the first recording of a speedo. <laughs> and Elijah outruns Ahab's chariot pulled by a horse 16 miles. Ahab runs home to tell his wife Jezebel what's happened. Listen to what Jezebel says. She is one tick lady. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me! That doesn't sound too serious because they couldn't consume one sacrifice, does it? May the gods deal with me ever so severely if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of my prophets. In other words, Elijah on the journey. Now Elijah has just slaughtered 450 prophets of Baal. He has just called fire down from heaven. And it drinks, it took everything that was in its sight. He has this first ever Forrest Gump superpower run for 60 miles. So when the wife of the king says, Elijah, I'm going to kill you, I can imagine Elijah saying to her, bring it on, baby, bring it on. I can see him doing his best Clint Eastwood imitation. Do you feel lucky? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what Elijah does. Elijah heard the message. He was Fear possessed him. He ran for his life, for Ahab's life. This powerful man was now frightened. The light was gone from being on top of the mountain to being in the bottom of the valley. Have you ever had a kind of mood swing like that? Have you ever had a spiritual swing like that? Have you ever go to church camp as a teenager? And then you go to church camp and you get fired up. You, you, you meet with God on the mountain and you come back down and you think, man, I am going to set the world ablaze for God. And that Saturday night, you go on a date with your girlfriend and boyfriend. And you go right back to the things you made in the movie. You go to a party with a group and you go right back to the same stuff to help you forget your past. Get to church, and somebody says something critical. In our day, it was about the length of our hair or the lack of length of the girl's skirts. <laughs> Some believe a well intentioned, but with four thought, took you off the mountain until you write it down. That's how I do it. It's how life works, isn't it? I'm so amazed in my own life how a beautiful day can turn bad just with one phone call, just with one missed appointment. Somehow it puts us in a Grumpy mood. But what, was Elijah's day really that bad? I mean, really, he stopped. Just look at the whole, was it that bad of a day? I mean, he had one, 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 and one, one, one woman. One woman. Let me tell you about that. I found this article in a Florida newspaper. This describes a man who I can really not tell you. Let me read it to you. A man was working on a motorcycle on his patio now a vision. Gary Best, as I'm telling you the story. It wasn't Gary, but that's what I did. I read this. I put Gary Best in. Man working on his motorcycle on his patio. And his wife was in the house in the kitchen. The man was gunning the engine on the motorcycle. And the motorcycle slipped into gear. The man, still holding onto the handlebars, was dragged through the glass patio door. And the motorcycle dumped into the floor inside the house. The wife, hearing the crash, ran into the dining room, found her husband lying on the floor, couch and bleeding, and the motorcycle laying on his leg next to him. The patio door was shattered. 
The wife ran to the phone. She summoned for an ambulance. Because they lived on a fairly large hill, the wife went down several flights of steps to the street to direct the paramedics up to their home. After the ambulance arrived, they transported the husband to the hospital. The wife uprighted the motorcycle, pushed it back out to the patio. Seeing the gas from the tank had spilled onto the dining room floor, the wife got some paper towels out. She blotted up all the gasoline, and she threw the paper towel in the toilet. The husband was treated at the hospital and then released to go home. After coming home, he looked at the shattered patio door and the damage done to the dining room table by his motorcycle. He became despondent, and he went into the bathroom to sulk. He sat on the toilet, and he lit up a cigarette. <laughs> After finishing the cigarette, he flipped it between his legs into the toilet bowl, where he was seated. The wife, who was in the kitchen, heard a loud explosion and the husband screaming. She ran to the bathroom and found her husband lying on the floor. He had been blown through the shower doors. His trousers blown off his legs. He was suffering burns on his buttocks and the back of his legs. The wife again ran to the phone, called for an ambulance. The same ambulance crew showed up the second time. The wife fed them in the street. The paramedics loaded the husband on the stretcher and began carrying him down to the ambulance. While they were going down the stairs to the street with the wife by their side, one of the paramedics asked the wife, How did your husband burn himself? She told him the story. The paramedics started laughing so hard, he tipped the stretcher, dumped the husband off, he rolled to the bottom of the hill, broke his arm in his leg. <laughs>
But failures in the human brain have no closure. The brain continues to spin the memory, trying to come up with a way to fix the mess and move from acne to inactive. And that is why I remember some of our failures with such clarity. Elijah feels like a complete failure. He is worn out and he is exhausted. Doesn't that represent our life sometimes? Feels absolutely worn out. And then we see the Energizer Bunny commercial. What do we know about the Energizer Bunny? It's going and going and going and going. Do you know what they don't tell you? They don't tell you those batteries don't last forever. He dies eventually. <laughs> he does. Body eventually stops and so do we. You're about so exhausted, so empty. You just don't think you can go on. You're completely defeated. Your life is physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually great. Every day in his life was on you. Every night. Page 206 of the story it says, When he lays down and retreat and falls asleep, and all at once, a man came to him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread, baked over hot coals, and a jar of water. He ate and drank, and then he laid down again and took another nap. Don't you think it's interesting that God was completely exhausted, completely depressed? The first thing that God did was he met his physical needs. Sometimes when we're going to get through a really difficult time, one of the most spiritual things we can do is take a nap, have a meal. That's why Baptists always do a lunch right after church. <laughs> <laughs> the days don't have to perspectives change when we're rested and nourished. But God did his meet a lot of his physical needs. And then also on page 206, the scripture says, The angel Lord came back a second time, touched him, and said, Get up, eat, for the journey is too much for you. And it was going to be, because it was going to be 40 days and 40 nights the journey he was going to take. Page 206, so he got up, ate, and drank some more, strengthened by that food, and I would suggest the rest. He traveled 40 days and nights until he reached forth the mountain of God. Then he went into a cave, and he took another nap. This was a 200-mile journey to Mount Sinai. That's the same place where Moses met with God. Some scholars believe it's the very cave Elijah went into was the same cliff that Moses hid in when God's presence passed before him. Elijah curled up in the dark in his cave to rest, and the word of the Lord kept him in. What are you doing here, Elijah? Don't you think God knew the answer? Hello, he's gone. <laughs> but what God does is he gives Elijah an opportunity to vent. Have you ever just on occasion to vent? You have a friend in such a relationship with God, the one you can vent to him, and you know what? He's much better at venting to than I am. So make an appointment with him to vent. He listens far better. He's much more patient. He's much more sympathetic. But if you have a friend who just tells you, and you're really upset, and you, and you just want to get some things off your chest, and you wouldn't say to anybody else, this is what God does for him. <coughs> notice what notice, Elijah Vance. I've been zealous for you, Lord. The Israelites rejected you. They tore down your altars. They put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left. Talk about a pity party. There's at least a hundred we know of. And now they're trying to kill me, too. Elijah's saying, God, I've been enthusiastic and passionate for you, and look where it's got me. You burned out for God, huh? You ever do that? You ever gotten wasted in doing church? In our records, God will begin to show us that He loves us just as we are. More than you and I can ever comprehend. It doesn't matter what we do, it doesn't matter what we say, God loves us. And don't have to earn it. I don't have to burn out trying to Jesus gives this beautiful picture and he says, Come to me, all of you who are tired and weary, and I will give rest for your souls. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my burden is light and my yoke fits perfectly well. Jesus says, Come, yoke up with me, I'll carry the load. You just walk and step with me. He said, Take my yoke, no yoke. <laughs> Maybe the very thing that you need is an encounter with God. The Lord said to Elijah, go out and stand in the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Notice that God doesn't try to correct Elijah's theology. He simply says, go stand and wait for my presence. 
And the verse goes on. Then a great and powerful wind tore from the mountainside. It shattered rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came fire. The Lord was not in this fire. Think about that. Elijah had just seen God in the fire a short time ago. But this time, God was not in the fire. This was the first concert of early wind and fire.
and he wants to speak to you. The question is, are you going to answer? Or are you going to sing your voice in heaven? Choice is yours. God still speaks. Do we still Dear God, thank you for the stories of Elijah and Jonah and Zephyr, the lessons that you want to teach us, that they mirror so much of 21st century life today. God, I want to be, I want to be part of your family who hears your voice and obeys your call. And I pray that not only will we have the desire to do that, but we will trust you for all this spring in which we are. Thank you for listening to our voices. May we wish you to give this name to God. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, don't forget to please believe to the side door. If you would, there's also a restroom directly across the pavilion. Thank you so very much. Have a great day.